Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. So, as the title states, we are into part three of this long series to cover the venerable Sky Raider. Before diving in, I'd like to thank Kim Eric Schur for stepping up and helping to support the podcast on Patreon. Welcome aboard. And now, on to today's show. In terms of nicknames, I think the Sky Raider has more than any other aircraft that I've looked at. I've used SPAD, and Super SPAD was also employed. Some refer to its longevity, its look, its functionality, or are simply call signs that stuck to the plane as a whole. I've mentioned Able Dog, Sandy, and Flying Dump Truck, but here is a list of other ones that I've found. The Destroyer, Hobo, Firefly, Zorro, The Big Gun, Old Faithful, Old Miscellaneous, Fat Face, Guppy, Q-Bird, Queer Bird, and lastly, the South Vietnamese called it Crazy Water Buffalo. I think I like that one the best. <laughs> Air Force Spads remained in combat in Vietnam up to the final withdrawal of U.S. forces in 1972, and any that were left over were turned over to the VNAF. In 1975, the South Vietnamese surrendered and most of the remaining A-1s were destroyed, formally ending the combat career of this amazing aircraft. So, what was it like to fly a Sky Raider? I was lucky to find an account written by Bud Davison and published in Flight Journal in 1999 describing his experience in flying one and I'm going to pick and read bits of his article to share with you his observations. We'll start with the pre-start checklist. Area clear, master on, mags off, mixture auto cutoff. Hit the pre-oiler to force oil into bearings before turning the engine over. Yell clear, engage starter, count eight blades and stop cranking. Hit the pre-oiler again. While this is happening, high pressure oil is making sure all the engine bearings are liberally bathed in oil. Engine starter and count 16 blades, four revolutions to clear cylinder of oil. The bottom cylinders of a radial, especially rights, love to collect oil while sitting. Fire it up with oil in a cylinder and the compression ratio goes to a billion to one and a rod is bent. It's a very expensive noise. Now the engine is oiled, cleared, and ready to start. Aux hydraulic boost is checked to make sure it's working in case the primary isn't. Fuel boost on, cranked another eight blades, primer button down, keep cranking, reach up with a free hand and flick the mag switches to both. At this point, a series of hollow coughs belch intermittent clouds of blue smoke past us. The smell of a radial engine permeates the cockpit. Eau de round moteur. Nothing smells like it. In seconds, the coughs blend together. The primer button is held down until it's running and the mixture control next to the throttle is shoved forward to rich. Check oil pressure, hydraulic pressure, everything else is coming up. A living, breathing horsepower factory is now sitting just in front of our feet. I leave my side of the canopy open and breathe in a little wonderfully fragrant toxic waste. The R3350, by the way, has an unusual sound to it. It has a vaguely mechanical undertone that at idle almost overpowers exhaust noise. It's probably the gears in the reduction unit whirling away, but it initially sounds a little like a piece of farm equipment. We leave the wings folded while maneuvering out towards the open area near the taxiway. It would be bad form to unfold the wings and hammer a Cessna flat. The Navy has a thing about accidental wing folding as evidenced by their folding controls. While the wings are folded, a large flat door in the middle of the console between the seats is open and the cover pokes the pilot in the leg, reminding him to not take off with the wings folded. Duh! 
To close the door requires pushing and turning a control handle in a well on the console. If it isn't in the right place, you can't close the door. As the wings slowly drop into place, a red bar about as big around as your thumb, which has been sticking out of the leading edge, is retracted flush, indicating that the wing pins have slid into place. I check to see if the console door closes flush. I check the red pin again. Looks okay, still. The Sky Raider, as with most tail dragging carrier aircraft, has a locking full swivel tail wheel. When the control on the left console behind the throttle is engaged, the tail wheel is locked straight forward, which supposedly makes the airplane track straight. It doesn't. The airplane will still wander. If it's unlocked, the tail wheel swivels and you have to stay right on top of it with brakes. Although the airplane was easy to taxi, I was surprised how often I had to tap a brake to keep from turning into the crosswind. I should have made better mental note of that characteristic. At the end of the runway, we did a Q&A type of checklist. I'll hold it up and call out an item, and Doc would confirm it in place. Wings down and locked? Check. Aux hydraulic pump off? Check. Boost pump on? Check. We ran down the list, making sure certain the trim was where it had to be, one and one half units right rudder, zero elevator for this load, and balanced ailerons as per the last time the airplane flew. We held the last two items, the tailwheel lock and mag check, until out on the runway and powered up ready to launch. It's recommended that power be brought up to field barometric pressure, about 30 inches just prior to takeoff to clear the plugs. The mags are checked at the same time. I was strapped in the maw of a hurricane. As the throttle went forward, the gigantic prop, which at idle had been a ratcheting circle of nearly visible blades, vanished. My legs were spread wide, my heels off the floor as my toes strained to keep the brake pedals nailed to the top. Angry air beat its way down the fuselage, hammering at the tail surfaces while my right arm tensed to keep the stick sucked into my lap. The throttle kept moving. 20 inches of manifold pressure. 30 inches. The noise built until thinking took a concentrated effort. I visually fixated on the runway centerline, so visible over the hulking nose. At least I was thinking, Sky Raiders have great visibility. Brakes off, throttle to 45 inches. I could go as high as 58 inches. The horsepower doubled. 2,000 horses plus, and as the brakes came off, the airplane stopped fighting me. It lunged ahead. We were perched on an invisible torrent of horsepower, converted to thrust through the miracle of aerodynamics. My brain rushed to keep up. Keep the nose straight. Get the tail up only after it's moving at a pretty good clip. I heard a voice inside my head asking, so what the hell is the definition of a pretty good clip? There was a pesky little 10 knot crosswind at nearly 90 degrees. I thought this big honker would ignore it. I was wrong. The nose headed into it. A little rudder, then a little more. Time to bring the tail up. I eased the stick forward and watched the nose move down. Although I expected to feel the hard rubber deck tire behind us leave the runway, I didn't. That feeling was lost in the cacophony of noise and vibration that surrounded me. In seconds, the gear was skipping up on the runway. It was ready to fly. I tightened up on the stick, the tiniest amount, and the airplane gracefully flowed into the air. I just made my first takeoff in a Sky Raider. One of my eternal impressions of that first takeoff was that, for some reason, the airplane just seemed light. I can't explain that. It didn't hunker down on the gear like a Mustang or a Bearcat, which don't change character until power and speed are well up. As soon as the power was up on the Sky Raider and we were accelerating, I could feel the airplane getting light, the oleos coming off the stops. Of course, we probably didn't weigh more than 15,000 pounds, so we really were light. As soon as the runway started to fall away, 
I saw the safety catch on the landing gear handle magically disappearing into the cockpit rail, letting the gear handle be moved into the up position. As soon as we were going uphill solidly, I made the first recommended power reduction to 38 inches. Then as the gear locked up, the power came back to 35 inches, the prop at 2600 RPM, where it stayed while we climbed upstairs. I didn't think too much about it at the time, but since the engine was designed to run on 130-145 octane fuel with an alternate of 100 and 130, there was no way with only 100 LL fuel available we could have reached the normal takeoff power of 56 to 58 inches without detonation setting in. As it was, we were only using 45 inches for takeoff, where the military recommends 48 inches just for climb. Lower power settings may be partially because of fuel limitations, but also because there's no reason to push an engine you actually own. None of us are actually 22 years old and burning up Uncle Sam's motor and fuel. Like I said before, I was just faking the role, not living it. At 58 inches, the Sky Raider must be a real hoss on takeoff. We ran upstairs at 1800 to 2000 feet per minute at 120 knots indicated. SPAD pilots have told me when fully loaded, they were happy to get even half that. As soon as the airplane was off the runway, I knew I liked it. The ailerons especially. Although they have conventional cables running to them, the controls are hydraulically boosted with the boost being perfectly balanced. The result is a set of slick controls that on all axes are on a par with, and actually better, meaning lighter and quicker than most prop fighters. Despite its huge size, the airplane is absolutely willing to dance. Dropping the nose to head back to the field, I was again brought up short. Nose down, it doesn't want to pick up speed anything like I expected. In fact, I had to really crank the nose down, trim into it to hold it down long enough to touch even 200 knots. With the speed brakes out and full ordnance, pilots doing the real thing must have been able to come in at terrific angles and still make the pullout. We were using 100 knots as a target speed in the pattern on downwind, which surprisingly enough, the airplane was perfectly willing to decelerate to just by reducing the power. I didn't have to yank it into a bank or anything drastic to get it slow. My intent was to hold 1,000 feet and 100 knots. We'd been cruising around at altitude at about 28 inches of manifold pressure. It was taking less than 20 inches to hold 100 knots. Then I threw the gear and flaps out and everything changed. The throttle went up and up and then up some more until I was back at 28 inches. This thing is dirty. Doc ran through the pre-landing checklist, told me he wanted 90 knots over the fence and to slowly decelerate all the way down to that number. At the time I thought, yeah right, just slowly decelerate and hold glide slope. I wasn't halfway through base leg when I realized I wasn't even beginning to work to hold speed. If I wanted 95 knots, it would sit at 95 knots. If I wanted 92 knots, that's what it would hold. The power was gradually coming back as I worked my way down final, trying to keep the runway numbers stationary in the windscreen. If they were moving up, I was going to be short. Moving down, I'd be long. At the bottom end of the throttle travel, it turned out there was really very little movement required to change glide slope. It was more of a pressure, and the perceived engine noise hardly changed at all. A little high. Pressure the throttle back. Coming back on glide slope, pressure it forward. Just follow the runway numbers with the throttle. Then the runway was right there, and the game was over. I was going to have to land this thing. This would be the heaviest tailwheel airplane I'd ever landed. I sneaked a quick peek at the windsock. I shouldn't have, and didn't need to know the wind was there. I was already one wing down and holding opposite rudder to keep the nose aligned with the setter line. In situations like that, it's just going to be what it's going to be. Deal with it. Cardinal rules of landing tailwheel airplanes. Keep the nose in front of you. Keep the airplane from drifting. 
hold three-point attitude. If you do all of those, gravity has a way of solving everything else. As I started to break the glide, I slowly began squeezing the throttle closed. I was talking to my right hand on the stick. I was telling it to get to three point, just as the runway came up. There the attitude is, hold it off, hold it. Oops, slight rudder needed. Keep it straight, hold it off, hold it off. Thunk. We touched down, on all three yet, and with no bounce. Something about even a blind pig finding an acorn once in a while fits here. Okay, I was down. Keep it straight. Eyes fixated on the center line. Feet connected to the eyes. A little left rudder. A little right. Brakes. More brakes. We coast to a halt. All right. Cheated death one more time. As I tried to decide which taxiway turn off to take, an Aztec behind me on short final said, Hey, how about it, Sky Raider? You going to clear the runway anytime soon? Again, thank you to Bud Davidson for putting in words and bringing us along on this wonderful experience that very few of us will ever actually get to do. And as we get to the bottom of this episode, I'd like to share with you the story of a Sky Raider survivor. Sky Raider AD6, Bureau number 134600, was built by Douglas at El Segundo, California, USA, and served with the U.S. Navy until 1965, when it was packed up and shipped to Vietnam as part of Operation Farmgate, which was the code name for an American Air Force mission operating in Vietnam before the overt U.S. entry into the war. It served there throughout and its last formal VNAF inventory record was 30th December 1974, when its history becomes a bit of a mystery. But investigations during the latter restoration effort turned up, in quotes, panels with Vietnamese writing, repaired combat damage, and replacement components of Soviet manufacture, which all suggested that the aircraft served in combat in Southeast Asia and likely continued to fly in the years following. In addition, scrap newsprint and other natural materials were located in an animal nest in the aircraft interior. This newsprint contained clear dates which suggest the aircraft remained in Vietnam until at least 1992. Close quotes. This restoration had begun in 2011 at the National Museum of the United States Air Force. Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio, but the aircraft had been acquired in 1997. It is now on display, painted up as The Proud American, and the USAF Museum's website states, open quotes, The Proud American had a long and storied record in Southeast Asia. Although many pilots flew the plane, it is renowned for three separate episodes. Lieutenant Colonel William Jones' Medal of Honor mission in 1968, Captain Ronald Smith's Air Force Cross mission in June 1972, and for being the last U.S. Air Force A-1 lost in combat in Southeast Asia in September 1972. Before we wrap up, I have to mention the Douglas's planned replacement for the Sky Raider. Wow. You're thinking the Sky Raider was so amazing, the follow-up must have been super amazing. Welp, not really. It did have a great name, though. A2D1 Sky Shark. It came about due to a 1945 U.S. Navy request to Douglas to develop a turboprop-powered attack aircraft. It was powered by an Allison T-40 engine which was really two Allison T-38 power sections joined together, driving two three-bladed contra-rotating propellers via a common gearbox. This system produced a whopping 5,100 equivalent horsepower. One of the engines could be shut down in flight to conserve fuel. The Sky Shark wasn't just a Sky Raider with a fancy new engine. The wing profile was changed, 
the tail was bigger, the cockpit was pressurized. And with that, the canopy had oval side panels instead of the bubble canopy of the AD. Weaponry was to be similar to the Sky Raider, with four 20mm cannon in the wings and munitions carried on pylons, one under the center line, one under each inner wing, four on each outer wing. The prototype XA2D1 first flew on the 26th of March 1950 and experienced severe engine vibration. Even so, 10 pre-production orders were placed. Engine problems continued and culminated on the 19th of December 1950 when test pilot Lieutenant Commander Hugh Wood was in a descent to land. One of the conjoined engines failed but did not decouple, so the good engine was powering the BADS compressor, robbing power. Also, even if he had been able to kill the whole engine and just glide, the props would not feather, causing crippling windmilling drag. Wood was unable to slow the rate of descent, resulting in a high-impact crash on the runway, and was killed. Fixes were introduced, including an automatic decoupler, but it took 16 months. In 1953, another test pilot, C.G. Doc Livingston, was flying the second prototype and was pulling out of a dive when he was surprised by a loud noise and an unexpected nose pitch up. Oil covered his windscreen, but the chase pilot told Livingston that the propellers were totally gone. At least Livingston was able to successfully glide in and land the airplane. The Sky Shark program was cancelled, but her older sister would continue to serve for about another quarter century. If you enjoyed this Sky Raider series, I ask you to come and join me on Patreon. The writing alone took three days of work, and that doesn't count the sound recording and editing, and although I enjoy doing it, it sure does help to get some support in the effort especially as my summer vacation ended a long time ago and I'm back to my day job. The cost to support me for a month is less than the cost of a bag of chips and a soda. So if you get at least the satisfaction of those snacks out of my work, I would ask you to help a brother out. Thanks again to all who do support the podcast through Patreon. I appreciate it more than you know. You can also check out some photos of what we've been talking about on the Patreon page. Those are available to all. I'll even throw in a picture of my completed Sky Raider model. Yes, somehow I finished mine before Tanner finished hers. But to be honest, hers has better detail than mine. Must be that fighter pilot hand-eye coordination. Until next time.